this, this is really a presentation about the definitions. Uh, one of the problems I think we have very often when we talk about urbanization is that we do mean different things. So um, I will just introduce uh, this, uh, this talk with uh, giving some definitions and uh, where they <coughs> come from, also the history. And then uh, the second part of the, this uh, talk is going to be about one of the issues which has been mentioned uh, at length in recent debates about climate change and migration, which is mass migration. What do people do when they are affected by climate change? Uh, we did some research of that, on that. We started saying, well, the assumptions which are made are not substantiated by evidence. So kindly GTZ, or GIZ as it is today, said, well, why don't you go out and see what's actually happening? And uh, we, we did. And uh, we came up with, with some typology or some suggestions on how we could classify the different types of movement as a result of uh, climate change. Uh, the, the idea behind all this, of <coughs> course, is that this uh, knowledge can inform uh, uh, policy making and be more relevant to reality. So we, we don't pretend to make models, but just to make the world a little bit more intelligible uh, by creating categories which are not too uh, strict. So starting with urbanization, I guess quite a lot of you will have heard about this idea that this is the center of the urban challenge. So what exactly does it mean? Well, you will also have seen this very often, that since 2009, half of the world population live in urban areas. Now, it is uh, increasing rapidly. It is incre increasing rapidly in <coughs> uh, absolute terms. In, uh, in proportion, this we are not actually seeing uh, a very rapid urbanization. There have been periods where urbanization has been faster. Uh, and uh, uh, it is also quite regionally uneven. Some, some regions are already 70-80% urbanized, so there is no process of urbanization going on any longer. Uh, so that there is a bit of a panic about fast urbanization, but it doesn't apply to everything. Um, the urban growth, however, is going to be population growth. So the future is uh, uh, urban. Uh, this also means that uh, poverty is going to be urban, that most <coughs> of the problems of development or mal uh, maldevelopment are likely to be urban. <coughs> and this will include the impacts of climate change to a large extent. And uh, of course, the critical issue is that most uh, urban growth or most growth of the population living in urban areas is going to be to in uh, the, uh, the regions of the world which are also the least equipped mm. because they are the poorest ones. And this applies especially to least developed countries, low income countries, uh, which already are facing challenges of providing the basic infrastructure for their urban populations. In other words, urbanization is costly. Uh, th there is an effort which needs to be made in providing basic infrastructure, which is potentially the real ch challenge. So what do we mean by urbanization? It is the proportion of the total population living in centers which are defined as urban. It is not the same thing as urban growth, which is uh, an absolute figure. Now the two <coughs> things are important because you can have an increase in urban population without having an increase in urbanization. You can also have an increase in urbanization <coughs> without necessarily having a large growth in the total population. So the two things need to be distinguished. Um, the other thing which I think everybody is quite familiar with is that we cannot really make comparisons between countries uh, because the definitions of what is urban can vary very much. What I think is probably less known is the variations over time. So if uh, we were, for example, to take China's definitions of what is urban, before the 70s, between the 70s and the 80s and now, there would be huge variations uh, of probably 10, 20%, which underlines the fact that urbanization is a highly political issue in very many cases. So what underpins urbanization? Why does urbanization happen? Part of it is demographic, but it's only part of it. <coughs> um, uh, migration 
is often considered to be one of the main uh, factors behind the urbanization, but the only two countries where uh, rural urban migration is actually the main component of urbanization are Indonesia and China. In the rest of the world, it is uh, natural population growth. It is also essentially a change in the economic base of a country. Um, what is very often forgotten is that while in 2009 uh, the majority of the world's population resided in urban areas, already by the, the mid-80s the majority of the world's population <coughs> was employed in activities which were not agricultural or not in primary sector. Uh, so th the changes in economic activities are very often the driver of uh, urbanization. And of course this is related to the location choices of enterprises and uh, national strategies which are for example where do national governments decide to invest in infrastructure which could be ports, railways, uh, uh, the infrastructure which attracts private capital and concentrates activity <coughs> in certain areas. Uh, there are economies of scale of course in concentrating activities which are economies of scale which are relevant to industry and services not so much to agriculture but they are to agricultural processing. So how do we measure urbanization? I think it's important to take into account that even when we say that <coughs> in 2009 most of the world's population lives in urban areas, that is an estimate. The UN is very careful to say that it is an estimate. We often forget it and treat it as if it was the truth. Now it's important to remember that it is an estimate because it is based on previous censuses. And some countries have not had censuses for more than 20 years. So it is really based on what has happened in the past and it could be a, a far away past and of course it could have been in periods where different economic trends and patterns were, uh, were shaping uh, population uh, distribution. We also usually think of regions as uh, being homogenous but if you look for example of uh, Africa there are huge differences between West and East Africa. So it all needs to be taken quite with quite carefully um, thinking. The other thing we usually think of is that urbanization means cities. But this is really not the case. Um, the mega cities which are usually what we <coughs> think is fastest growing are not at all the fastest growing. And it is only 10% of the total urban population. Of course it is the wealthiest urban population usually. So that's where you have concentrations of consumption and uh, investment in infrastructure and so on. And in decision making, that's usually where uh, governments reside. Uh, cities are also uh, quite a small proportion. What is very much the largest and fastest growing proportion are small towns. Now this is important because small towns are usually the ones where governance mm. is particularly lacking and uh, to have successful cities uh, or cities which are livable and contribute to sustainable development, what is really important is uh, governance. So how does this all fit with uh, mobility and with uh, rural urban linkages? Um, again, the evidence is that this is not uh, um, such a homogeneous process and linear process. There is evidence of de-urbanization in some African nations. There is also evidence of de-urbanization in some regions in Africa. Um, for example, this happened in Ghana in the 80s, where small towns declined because uh, cocoa prices declined. And so small towns which were just above the threshold of being classed as towns, so they were just above 5,000 inhabitants, when prices of international commodities went down, people started moving out and uh, the small town became a village again. Yeah. Um, this may look different if we don't understand what are the processes at the local level and the context. Uh, similarly, India uh, usually comes up with census data which uh, are very much what was not expected in the sense that urbanization has not progressed mm -hmm. as rapidly as uh, was uh, projected 10 years ago or even 20 years ago. Uh, what we have more indications <coughs> of uh, is greater mobility. Again, I should say that this sort of movement is not recorded by census data. Uh, 
So we know it's happening, we think it is happening because we have small scale, usually qualitative uh, data or small scale surveys, uh, but we do not really know for sure that it is happening. But we think it is happening. I think that it's common experience that it is happening. Um, and we also see that it is, uh, uh, there is a gra great variety of destinations and of points of origin. So the whole idea that urbanization is linked to movement from rural areas to urban areas really <coughs> is not that, uh, that clear <coughs> from the information we have. But we do know that rural-urban linkages are increasingly important for livelihoods. So this is something that some work has looked into th this. And uh, I think, again, it is important to look at how diverse uh, mobility and rural urban linkages can be. So the successful side, if you want, is the accumulation strategy. Uh, you accumulate assets by moving into different places and having a access to different sources uh, of uh, income, of um, activities of several kinds. What I'm going to talk about now is uh, generalization. So please bear with me, it is just very broad pictures, which is just to differentiate this from the survival strategy, which <coughs> is the other face facet of uh, mobility and rural urban linkages. Um, so as an accumulation strategy, we're usually talking of household level. And that means that uh, individuals within households can specialize. So you may have someone who's uh, the one of the children who gets the investment in education and goes to the city and then sends money to relatives who may then invest in uh, intensification of production in rural areas. That the assumption here is that you have a division of labor within the household which remains the unit. Uh, um, so you have cross-investment uh, between farm and non-farm activities. There is quite a lot of documentation of this, uh, for example in Nigeria. Uh, in Vietnam and in other countries where uh, migrants to the cities literally send money, not only money but also information <coughs> about markets and this is the engine which the proximity to the city is not only proximity to markets but also to a source, source of cash or capital uh, within the household. Uh, this works when there is good infrastructure and there are good market links between rural and urban areas. So in a way, uh, the context, again, is extremely important. And this is what governments and local governments can do. And that, again, is where the functions and the capacities of local governments is extremely important in determining what people can actually do. Uh, also, secure land tenure and access to natural resources are important. Uh, and also access to labor markets, including education uh, and uh, the acquisition of skills. Now, when you don't have that, mobility can become a survival strategy. And this is often at the individual level. So the same person will go through a series of jobs throughout uh, seasonal uh, periods uh, throughout the year. This usually means that people are not skilled when they do this sort of thing. So they may move to the city <coughs> to work as unskilled laborers or move from the city to the rural areas as wage laborers on a seasonal basis. Mobility is dictated by lack of opportunities rather than by the availability of opportunities. So it's more, it, in migration terms, this would be more push uh, factors rather than pull factors. It also usually involves insecure living and working conditions in uh, either rural areas uh, or urban areas or in both. And uh, this is the case, for example, of construction workers very often all the unskilled workers who do not have uh, um, adequate accommodation <coughs> when we, they go to the cities, who work in uh, um, very often exploitative uh, conditions and so on. These are also the workers who have been most affected by the crisis, the financial crisis in recent years. And of course, there, there is limited access to assets, to the basic assets which are natural capital, physical, and uh, human capital. So there are this, these two roles, in a way, which are uh, how livelihood strategies can build on rural urban linkages. 
So on the basis of this, this is more or less the conceptual basis we started from to look at uh, uh, climate change and the impacts of climate change on uh, mobility. Um, very broad terms, climate change and poverty uh, have very strong links and I think this is very familiar to, to all of you. Um, climate change affects groups who rely primarily on natural resources for their livelihoods. That would seem to be rural populations, but actually it is also the, the urban poor, <coughs> simply because the urban poor usually live in locations which are um, exposed to environmental hazards, uh, which are usually the cheapest areas, the, where land is cheaper, where uh, there is no competition from uh, people who can have access to better housing. Uh, it could be on flood <coughs> plains, for example, it could be on uh, very steep slopes, uh, areas which are uh, subject to landslides, or very simply, areas where there are no services. So there is no surface drainage, so floods <coughs> will be affecting these areas more often. There is no sanitation, so when there are floods, when it rains, you have all the sewage which comes out and so on. So that sort of environmental hazards are very strongly linked to climate change. Flooding is actually one of the key hazards uh, related to climate change in uh, urban areas. Now, this is around one billion people. Uh, very often one third of residents in many cities. So we're not talking of marginal populations, we are talking of uh, populations which are growing. If you take, for example, the Millennium Development Goal, which was on uh, reducing poverty, part of it was reducing uh, the, the number of residents of urban slums by 100 million. This uh, um, goal has been exceeded. The problem is there are more people who have moved into slums. So effectively, in absolute terms, there has been an increase, although there has also been a reduction, which means that uh, the, the MDG, the relevant MDG, has been successful. Uh, this is food for thought in terms of what are going to be the important post-MDGs uh, um, objectives. <coughs> It also highlights how, in many ways, these are the non-income dimensions of urban poverty, which are perhaps more relevant than the income dimensions. Um, we were talking about this recently. Um, if you go to Manila, in many places, uh, under bridges, uh, which are on small uh, rivers, not, not bridges which you can literally not notice when you're going by car, there will be people living in slums which are attached under the bridge. Now, when you see people coming out of these places in the morning, they will, have, uh, they will be perfectly dressed with iron shirts and they will go to works, to jobs which are very often in offices, service workers. You would not identify them as the poor, the way we <coughs> think of the poor. So, urban poverty in many cases is not necessarily related to income but to the cost of living and to the, to the inadequate provision of uh, shelter, accommodation, and basic services. So what happens with climate change then? How, how do we see migration as a response to climate change? The reason why we started looking at this is that in the climate change uh, debates, uh, uh, I would say probably five or six years ago, there was this huge conviction that Climate change would result in something like over 2 million, 200 million uh, uh, migrant refugees who would uh, move from low-income countries, possibly towards <laughs> rich countries, and there would be this vast wave of uh, environmental refugees. Now there is a growing consensus that it is not that simple. So there are huge differences between people who are displaced by climate change impacts and that is likely to be short term. So people who are displaced by floods or by landslides or other extreme events. Then there will be voluntary migration, people who could not, cannot um, engage in economic activities because of climate change, for example, because of drought and so on. And then there will be distress migration, which is forced migration of a different kind. Um, what seems to be important, however, is that if we do not understand 
the diversity of the destinations, the durations, and the composition of flows. It's very difficult then to formulate and implement appropriate policies which do protect migrants. And uh, there is also the assumption that most movement is going to be towards cities. And this is usually seen as a very negative sort of movement. Uh, the UN does every two years uh, a very interesting report which is on population policies, uh, population distribution policies uh, by governments. And uh, there has been uh, a steady increase in uh, policies which try to stop people migrating to the cities. So this varies <coughs> from being uh, uh, policies for rural development uh, to policies which just make it more difficult for migrants to reside in cities. So we went to three countries and looked at locations where climate change is uh, actually occurring. Uh, these are uh, areas with uh, environmentally fragile contexts and with a tradition of high mobility. So even before climate change, these are areas where people have moved a lot uh, because you may have no rain one year and uh, because the, you don't really have a fallover position which is locally available, people move. Now, we assumed that these were also areas where there would be the, the main type of impact would be slow onset. So droughts uh, or changes in rainfall, um, variability, and so on. What we found, and we were quite surprised to find this, was that everybody in these places could trace a catastrophic event to a very precise date. And initially, we didn't think these were particularly important events, they didn't seem to be so when we looked at the climate side of things. When we asked people what actually happened, what people were talking about were, was something different. It was the combination of uh, non-environmental uh, crisis, if you want, with environmental crisis. And basically it was uh, the foreclosure <coughs> of uh, opportunities for diversification of livelihoods locally. So people had to move. Uh, in Bolivia, it was the closure of mines. Uh, that was in the 80s and coincided with uh, El Nino. So basically, people, farmers who used to go to the mines when uh, there was a crisis in agricultural production found that they couldn't do it. In Senegal, it was the, the collapse of international prices for um, groundnut. And in Tanzania, it was the beginning of land grant. Um, and so all this created catastrophic events which forced people to change quite substantially the way <coughs> they were um, making their livelihoods. And we identified three different types of uh, migration. And I think this is, this is quite a good finding because in a way, these were people who were coming from the same areas, but they responded in quite different ways. So a typology of mobility can be useful to try and understand how people can, can actually respond and how sustainable these responses are. So seasonal mobility, rural to rural and male dominated, this was a response of the poorest groups, very often from poor locations as well. Um, from areas of rain-fed agriculture and where there, were, there wasn't really much to do locally. But what was important, and this was for example the case in Senegal, in Senegal, you would, you would think, why do people bother to continue to do family farming? You know, this, this is crops which fail pretty much every other year. Why are they still staying there? And <coughs> the, the feeling we had was that actually it is the combination of family farming with other activities which provides a range of uh, um, Possibly not one safety net, but something that, you know, if this fails, there's this other possibility <coughs> or even another one. All minimal, all not particularly effective, but all of them together did provide some sort of uh, uh, resilience. What we also thought was quite interesting is that most of these farmers <coughs> were, going to, were working seasonally on family farms. So family farms which can afford it usually have uh, quite a large proportion of uh, grown-up children of the family labor which has gone to the cities, sending back cash. Now, what you have then is cash-rich households with labor shortages. 
which will then attract um, wage laborers from other areas. I think this we, we are underestimating how much this represents a transformation in family farming and small scale farming, which relies increasingly on uh, mobile labor and uh, yeah, seasonal uh, migrant workers. Temporary migration is uh, more towards towns, I would say not cities, but smaller urban centers. This is also very often across borders, but it's not uh, I really international migration. It, it's still local. If it involves crossing a border, it's fine, but it's, you know, it's local. It could be, for example, from Bolivia to Argentina and these sort of distances. Um, a large number of women, very much the reason for this is demand for housemates. And uh, one of the reasons for this is that uh, the emergence of the middle class, where women in the cities are educated and uh, are employed, but you still do not have the infrastructure to provide uh, um, childcare, um, domestic work, uh, which is usually undertaken by women. So the demand for housemates uh, is, is very high in, uh, I would say, in locations or contexts mm -hmm. where there is no, um, I would say, no common responsibility through the provision, for example, of uh, um, childcare, um, nursery schools and so on. That remains very much something for the family or looking after all the relatives. It remains something that women are supposed to do, but women are already out of the, the household. They're already working. So replacement women come in, and that creates this other type of uh, movement. This, in turn, I think, and that was another of the interesting findings, is that it is linked to international migration. Now, for a long time, international migrants used to invest in the larger cities, especially in uh, property, housing. The whole center of Addis Ababa has been uh, built by international migrants. The whole center of Dakar in Senegal, and so on and so forth. Uh, so much so that then uh, the cost of land has gone so uh, become so high that uh, even international migrants cannot afford that. So they have moved to small <coughs> towns, and so there is increasingly requests for for young men, for example, or boys even, uh, to work in construction work. Uh, for young women to work as housemaids for the relatives or the old relatives who have stayed behind and so on. So it's, it's a creation of an economy which is still dependent on international migration. But there are several steps between international migration and how this then creates uh, internal migration. And of course, again we're back to the issue of uh, governance in small towns. The living and working conditions uh, are huge risks for migrants going to these areas. And then permanent rural-urban migration to the cities, well, this one really is not something which is affected by climate change at all. So any concerns by policymakers that urbanization and the growth of the larger cities is going to be affected by climate <coughs> change actually has no <coughs> evidence whatsoever from the case studies that we conducted. These are people who would have moved to the cities anyway because they're better educated, they're wealthier, and they want to use different types of opportunities. So what does it say about mobility as adaptation in general terms? Uh, what we found is that it is adaptation to climate change, but it is also adaptation to other types of transformations. and. Uh, but we need to be quite careful in thinking of it as adaptation only. It can be just coping. And uh, so that there is room for uh, um, policies to protect migrants. Uh, uh, at the same time, the most vulnerable households in areas which are affected by climate change are everywhere those who do not re receive remittances. So an injection of cash from elsewhere seems to be absolutely essential part of uh, household finances. Um, and again, remittances are used for investment. And that has been something which has been discussed for a long time. Are remittances the way to development? <coughs> How can we convince migrants to use uh, remittances uh, 
in a way which is productive and not just related to consumption. But the, I think the answer is very simple. If there is high potential, so if there is infrastructure, access to markets, there is security of tenure, people will invest. Otherwise, they will not invest just because it's their home area. And I think that is uh, a very reasonable approach to investment and risk. So, in general terms, migration helps with development, but only where the developmental gaps are limited. Um, remittances are not a shortcut to development. Uh, they will not uh, replace uh, um, public investment in public goods, uh, in public infrastructure, <coughs> and so on. So migration and mobility is just one part of rural urban linkages. The, the other elements which link urban and uh, rural areas, uh, people, enterprises, and, uh, and in general economic activities uh, cannot be uh, replaced only by what is essentially individual or household level uh, investment. And so supportive institutions are uh, a pretty important part of that. And it, uh, the feeling is that when we talk about migration and remittances, we tend to forget about institutions and how the enabling environment <coughs> is so important to then make migration more of an adaptation strategy rather than a coping strategy. And so the policy implications is that uh, when we talk of climate change, development is, of course, the best form of, of adaptation, but it has to be pro-poor, otherwise it increases uh, um, social polarization. <coughs> Strengthening rural urban linkages also helps, but again, only if it is pro-poor. So what does it mean to be pro-poor? Um, I think it, it, this revolves around uh, access to assets, uh, income diversification, uh, and uh, also rights issues. So it is generally an issue of a matter of rights, access, uh, and enabling environments. And so to conclude, I think we, we have been very confused for a long time. Does mobility drive transformations or does it reflect transformations? And I think that the work we have done in the context of climate change, which is a transformation which is not obviously created by mobility to a large extent, at the global level at least, it suggests that mobility is a response to transformations. It's not the other way around. Um, it cannot be stopped, but it is extremely diverse. So in some ways, maybe talking of migrants can be misleading. <coughs> there, there's su such a diverse group that it may become quite confusing to, <coughs> to think of them as something which just because you're migrating you share too many characteristics. And so again, uh, local institutions, especially in small towns, are uh, by far the weakest ones, but also the ones which play the most important role. Thank you.